We're delighted to welcome you here today. C'est un grand plaisir d'être co -moderate. And I'm delighted to be a co-moderator with Annabelle. We have about an hour to debate here, and we hope to have an exchange of ideas uh, between the people here up on stage and you in the audience. So we're going to start with a little presentation. Creativity, how to invest in creativity. We know that in some countries up to 11% of the uh, GDP is invested in creativity. So how can we attract governments, international institutions and private sector and encourage them to invest in creativity? Yes, you're quite right. Just to give you some uh, housekeeping information, we have a lot of meetings held in English. We're going to be speaking French, but as I'm sure you know, there is interpretation available if you need it. Chris. We're going to start with Phil Winsor, a philosopher and author and economist. He's just written the book Afrotopia, which is going to be discussed at Boza this evening, which I can highly recommend. And next to him, sorry, no, not quite next to him, we have Mr. Jean Louisville. Head of uh, of human resources within DG Devco. We also have Edouard Matoko, Joint uh, General Director for this uh, department in UNESCO. And next to him, we have the Deputy Ministry Minister of Foreign Affairs for Italy, Mario Giro. And we also have Rokia Traore a singer from Mali. Uh, you also have an organization in Mali for young people focusing on creativity and uh, especially dance, music, theater, yes. Excellent. So we have uh, an excellent range of uh, representatives here from government and uh, elsewhere. So. Uh, we wanted to kick things off. How do you think we can motivate and encourage people to invest in culture and creativity? I wanted to start with you, Mr. Felinsa. You're an economist, but at the same time, you're also uh, an artist. So with your books give a really human angle to economy. It's more than just economy. So what's your view? What can we do to encourage more investment in culture? I think that normally investors want something sustainable, which will definitely give them a profit. So they will want to know whether these uh, cultural goods will uh, sell, will be popular, will work. What you have to get them to understand is that these uh, cultural goods are different and it's not just economic financial factors at play here. We have different factors at play within society and there are certain qualitative aspects that have to be taken into account in the long term and we need to rethink what return on investment really means. So this often means changing the types of companies that we're dealing with, organizations, all of these organizations related to culture, shaping um, society. These are all things linked to culture, and that's a deeply human societal thing and so you have to take that into account when we're looking for a return on investment they investors need to help create an ecosystem which will help these uh, cultural goods uh, find buyers they need to be well produced and in order to do that we need 
investment in infrastructure, in education, training, in cultural centers, in the right types of uh, spaces which don't yet have the uh, requisite funding. So you're saying we need to focus on the long term. That's the main obstacle. Yes, we need to think beyond short and medium term. And you need to rethink culture. It's not just uh, uh, something that produces simple products. It's so much more than that. And so when we talk about uh, development, we need to broaden uh, our horizons beyond simply uh, economic aspects as well. Now, you've talked about the, the language that we use here. I think that we are familiar with the uh, economic structure, and now it needs to be adapted for uh, this cultural, societal uh, challenge. We're not just selling products here. When we're dealing with culture, we're trying to uh, produce meaning. It's not just a simple economic act. We need to think about cultural industries in a, a new way, and we need to make sure that we don't forget we're trying to improve people's well-being here. It's not just an economic process. Now, you're, you said we're not just investing in artists, but also in the places that they uh, perform, centers they use. Yes, I'm talking about an ecosystem. You, whether you're talking about the artist or product, you want to have an environment which will help them to thrive. If you don't have that, you won't get a return on your investment, be it literature, fine arts, painting, or other uh, forms of culture. You need that ecosystem. You need the value chain. You need the right stakeholders. And all of that needs to be well organized. You can't just uh, focus on one link in the chain. You need to take the whole ecosystem into account. We also need to uh, rethink return on investment. We need a new definition of this. What could that be? Uh, we need to think about why we're investing in culture. We're investing in creativity. The future is now. That's the name of this session. We want to really improve people's lives this way. I don't think that we should lose sight of that very important goal. Improving people's lives, improving how they uh, experience life and society, that is the, the ultimate goal for us. We know that culture is a, a vector of human and social development and promotes uh, growth, stability, and I think that uh, that's something we should not forget. Before we move on, Edouard, I wanted to ask you about all of these names we have up on the screen. During this panel, here we have the 14 different organizations who have helped us to achieve what we uh, have today. During the year of culture and sustainable development, they want to stress the importance of the impact that investment in culture can have. That's what we're talking about today. And so it is uh, with great pleasure that I uh, introduce the Minister of Culture for Burkina Faso, Mr. Tavi, if you could just stand up. He'll, he's going to talk to us after this panel, and then the uh, ambassador from Burkina Faso. Welcome. The ambassador to the European Union. And we have the general secretary of the CGLU Africa. Welcome. He, too, is going to speak to us later. We're going to move on to our next speaker, Edouard. I see in your CV that you have uh, traveled a great deal in Latin America, in Africa for UNESCO. So out 
in the real world, based on your experience, what can we do? How can we encourage governments, organisations like your own and private sector stakeholders to invest more in culture and creativity? Yeah, uh, merci there. Thank you very much. Well, my colleague referred to a number of important points, but we need to decide what we're going to invest in, for whom and for what. We're talking about yield, productivity, but what do you invest in in Africa? The main problem for creators in Africa, well, it's in fact twofold. There's a lack of infrastructure, first of all, and secondly, there's a lack of regulation or certainly application of existing rules. You know that Africa's, South Africa really loses 44% of its GDP due to piracy. Now you see that in many African cities, you're surprised to see the amount of cultural creativity, but also creativity to keep an informal economy going. This is an economy we don't speak about very often. So when we talk about investing in creativity, we need to highlight that in Africa, except for a few exceptions, the main problem is a lack of infrastructure. We also spoke about uh, training, education, and to ensure that younger people and not so young people have the possibility to come together and create things in order to avoid leaving the country. Now this is a problem in Africa in some areas. We have brain drain, but we also have talent drain all our artists. So you're talking about responsibilities of governance and institutions such as yours. But how do you get this private sector to invest? How can you get them to invest in information and so on? Well, we need to create a legislative, economic and financial framework which will allow the private sector to invest. Now, there are, in fact, some examples. There is some, every cloud has a silver lining. So you can see that you have Fespaco, for example. Conakry was the capital, world capital of books. And perhaps we'll have an African book festival in Conakry soon. Yeah, Magic System, for example which is a well-known festival, music festival, which is taking place in Africa, in Abidjan specifically. So there are local initiatives which need to be encouraged. But in the private sector, it's not going to waste its money. So you need to ensure there's a legislative framework so that we in the international scene can ensure international institutions have the means to create this legislative and financial framework which will allow the private sector to invest in Africa. Well, it makes me, leads me to my question. What, is the, what are the priorities? Well, indeed, over the past 20 years, we, we no longer talk about this. About 10% of national budgets in developing countries are spent on culture and culture-related aspects. You have culture ministries which combine art, tourism, and so on. But the the it's no longer a theoretical question. Th having conventions, uh, African Charter for Cultural Creation, the Ministry of Culture in the African Union. So there is all of this. There is a great deal of action. And what we are doing in the European Union and the governments working on this, we need to ensure that this becomes action. Theory needs to become action. Well, why do we have such a high level of creativity in Africa? Well, there are so many young people creating. And as I said, they don't, they're not supported in their efforts. We're talking about cultural governance. But why are African artists leaving? There are very few who stay in Africa. And just to give you a simple example, we have 60, 70 artists from Congo, Central Africa, who are living in poverty. But they don't even have a simple social security system where they would be looked after. Rokia Traoré from Bamako, Mali, sings, composes, writes, is a goodwill ambassador for the UNHCR. 
And in addition, you are a star. I'm delighted to see you here. I've seen you on stage so often doing your work. But you decided to share your talent with a whole series of people, people where you come from. You want to share the glory that you receive through your shows and your songs with these young people. So you could also answer these questions. I imagine you followed what's being said. You probably think, oh, well, that's very far from reality. Yes, but I, I'm afraid I wasn't really surprised. There really are two different worlds when we talk about culture in Africa. There's one world where there's a lot of obstacles and people face uh, challenges in dealing with the institutional structures, how to uh, work with these rules, creating new laws, be it on a national level or working uh, on an international level with institutions to try and achieve progress. And then we have the other world of uh, how they can be actually, these rules can be put into force. And we have all of these artists who have to uh, go abroad. There are those who come back, there are those who never come back. And there's a certain economic and cultural environment which already exists independent of the rules, the governments, the structure, which is still uh, struggling to really align with the reality that artists are facing. That's where we need to work, work together and get organized. Personally, I think every uh, woman who I've worked with, I paid them out of my own um, pocket given them enough money to take a sort of maternity leave so that they can look after their uh, child uh, and then go back to work. There's no system for that. That's what I've uh, tried to do myself. And across all African countries, I'm sure that whether these are initiatives we are already familiar with, there are artists who have decided to grasp the bull by the horns and try and tackle the problems that they're facing themselves, where they don't have support or they don't have adequate support yet. So like uh, Selwyn said, we need all of these different initiatives to be uh, brought together to be uh, mapped. We, it feels like uh, nothing is happening. How can we attract investors, big investors, that's the real question, with more money? We already have some investors who are working with a very little uh, funding, and sometimes that's very complicated because there's no security for them, there's no support from the uh, municipalities in general, but we are still making progress. Would you give the following advice then? We need to recognize the value of cultural products that are already in place. We need to make sure we have a, a view of this which is in line with reality. Well, what is happening in Africa today? I get the impression that there's no real awareness on the institutional, international institutional side or even on our government side of all the artists that are out there and what they're doing. And if we manage to um, get word out, to promote what's already there, or to uh, get back those people who left the, or, and bring together those people who are working, who never left uh, in various different cultural fields, dance, theater, song, if we have all these people, yet the government isn't aware of them, well, we have a problem. We need to link up the artists with cultural promoters, talk about the difficulties that they're all facing, and talk to uh, the audiences as well. We are only working in this field because there is demand for what we're doing. Most of the time, the means, the resources we have available to us are so restricted that we can't really reach our audience. 
And you need an infrastructure, an organization that can help that. But no one structure or investor will be able to do that alone. We need more. You mentioned sustainability. And we mentioned that at the start. So the short term, we're pretty sure of. But what about the long term? The projects that you have set up as a, as a well-known, respected artist, and that you could perhaps gain more funding for by uh, promoting them, how can you uh, improve the work you do? It can't just be down to you. I know you're quite right. Trying to make sure that we create something lasting, that requires training. What do you mean specifically? Well, if I think of the last uh, challenge we uh, faced, which we still haven't found a solution for, using these very complicated uh, methods, we found lighting and uh, sound equipment for a venue but now we need a technician to actually uh, manage it and run it. So we could bring people from uh, the EU and they are they're going, then going to be able to train sound technicians and help them to get into this uh, career, sound and lighting. But we don't have enough. We're going to have to teach them how to set up, clean up, start everything. But we need more than that. They need more training. And that's uh, where we overlap with the labor, with the jobs market. We still don't have enough uh, uh, people to uh, meet our needs. That's the situation that we're in, and we need more uh, investment in, in order to improve that situation in Africa. Mario. You just heard what uh, Rokia said. As a representative from a member state, Italy is a member state of the European Union, what role do you think that national level policies can play in helping to finance projects uh, like hers, like uh, the Passerelle Foundation? Well, I think it's important to say that culture is an economic sector. When the Italian culture minister was appointed the latest culture, I see this as an extension to the economy ministry because in Italy, culture is perhaps not, the cultural ministry is not public. But it, so we need to look at this from a different point of view. Art is not just the artist we see on stage, and as uh, the lady to my left said, there are a whole series of things involved. If you go to Fespaco, and I was lucky to pre be present, you see how many jobs are linked to this. Uh, you have directors who direct films, you have design, uh, you have so many things involved. It's not just fine arts, and this is why in our ministry, on the ministry website, we've stated that all uh, higher, uh, we've included all higher level institutions involved in art. We had the ministry, cultural ministry from Quebec, who said to me, well, my dear colleague, my, our young people don't all want to do maths, business, administration, at university. They want to learn something else. Give me a list of your universities where we can study fashion, cinema, music. Music is a good example. There is always a big public, a big audience for music, but you need structures, you need people who know how to do it. And all of this is linked to cultural uh, sector. But yes, you need something back. You need a kind of a, a yield. There are some countries who are interested in their cultural roots, identity, and so on. But it also needs to help bring people together and be a vector for dialogue. So we can see, for example, what's been done 
in some countries. There are countries where uh, art is linked to design, uh, but it's linked to all of the industry in Italy. It's linked to everything you see. But from a point of view of national policy, for example, taxation is a national competence. But perhaps you could have measures for companies who invest. Well, yes, this does indeed exist already. There are cultural bonuses. There are programs. But apparently, this isn't enough. It's not effective enough. But well, if you wait for the public for its citizens to act well, what actually happens is that the private sector, we, we need to ensure the private sector becomes more involved. But what's difficult is to consider it as an economic sector. If you, it, it can often be considered as a secondary sector. May I finish my statement? Well, there are some countries who interpret it from an identity point of view, others who consider it as an innovative economic sector. And then there are others. If you go into the poor areas of these countries where they open centers for uh, popular culture. And it really depends on the country. It depends on how you look at these things. I see that a big effort is being made, in particularly by the private sector, because it knows that it, there is a good return in the private sector. Well, yes, what I wanted to say in the previous sector, in the previous thing I was saying, there it already exists. But we need a framework. When we're talking about uh, tax facilitation, the state is not giving anything. We're not asking the state to do something. But if the state can make it easier to pay tax while we're trying to get something up and running where there is no state aid provided, this would be a welcome contribution. And this would allow those in the cultural field and private investors to have an area which would be very favorable for investment. Well, yes, this is what we're doing in Italy. And there are countries which allow their artists to pay uh, their taxes through their work, through their production. There's an idea. Well, now we're talking here about Italy, indeed. And the efforts which are being made and the aid which is provided can often be more effective in Africa. But unfortunately for us, artists in Africa, our, our word isn't always accepted. But here, we are being listened to to try and find solutions. We see what work is being done in the international institution international community. So we're moving towards a solution for culture in general. It's important that even if we are not being listened to with our decades of experience and all of the efforts we're making in our countries, it's important to take into account the examples we already have to hand in order to create a fertile breeding ground for culture in general. Because whether it's for us or future generations, we cannot leave things as they are. Where there is an economic potential, but also potential in other levels. And we, this would be a shame not to make the most of it, which is the, currently the case in Africa. Well, yes, I fully agree with what you've just said. And of course, we can never do enough. I'm sure that artists in Italy aren't content either. I'm sure they, won't, they want more. 
So it's all very complicated. This is, we need to highlight the fact that it is a profitable sector. This is something we need. Now, I don't mean in the bad sense of the term profitable. It creates jobs. It creates an awful lot of work. Yes, I think that everyone present here has already stressed that, that you agree with that, that you are working within the DG Devco, Jean-Louis. Do you, within your organization, feel that the EU is doing its bit to share this uh, burden and um, promote the profitability of culture in a broader sense? Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I think that there's a, a great deal that's already been said by, by previous uh, speakers. I'm, uh, I'm going to put aside my speaking notes. So yes, I think that we are facing a changing environment. The fact that we are here where the uh, opening ceremony is going to take place shows the great importance that uh, is attributed to this very topic. Of course, we uh, have witnessed ups and downs. We have tried to uh, reintegrate culture in uh, development and cooperation. That is something that is still uh, ongoing, and that's part of the changing uh, context. I think that ties in with what other speakers have said. But more specifically, yes, we have uh, programs. We distribute uh, funding. We allocate funding. It's never easy. There are uh, so many things that we want to do, that we want to support, projects we want to support but that we can't. But we are committed to the idea that culture is uh, a form of uh, societal glue. It, isn't something that needs uh, aid. It can be a key part of uh, development for uh, the society, for creating jobs, for um, all these different uh, aspects. And that involves training and other uh, matters. But of course, I think the, the minister uh, outlined his view of uh, the environment that we have created. We have other partners as part of this environment uh, in civil society, for example. Uh, why? It's not just economic stakeholders we're working with. We want to uh, help overcome uh, conflicts in some uh, areas. We want to help society to develop. As the first speaker said, that's important for us. Often we are dealing with post-conflict situations, conflict situations, and uh, culture can help communities to recover and bring people together. And that is something that we should not and cannot underestimate in our work. Yes, because as you said, cultural stakeholders work in, uh, out in the field. They are the ones on the front line. And they are the ones trying to uh, restart dialogue between different uh, groups. That's a vital element. It's something we outlined in our global strategy on security. I don't want to go through that in detail. We have a lot of high-level documents on this which outline our policies and the importance of culture. As for investment, what we're trying to do and what we want to achieve is to go beyond uh, subsidizing uh, projects and programs. We have numerous uh, examples of projects where investment has worked well. We want to continue and do more. But what we also want to do with the new uh, investment plan, which is currently being adopted, is to point out that this investment plan is not just an economic investment plan. It's for culture, it's for society. So we want to make sure that uh, stakeholders in the uh, cultural sector 
will be able to use this tool. So it won't just boost investment, but it will provide guarantees as well, protecting investors from risk and encouraging them to uh, take a risk in this sector, which may be riskier than others. I'm not no expert. Yes, Jean-Louis. In terms of risk sharing, this uh, sustainable development fund, will it help share the risk, spread the risk across different bodies and private sector? Yes, you're quite right. The idea is that the private sector is given incentives to uh, invest. So it's not subsidies, it's not funding, it's more of a, a a guarantee to minimize the risk, which will encourage investment, not just in the cultural field, but in others as well, in particularly in countries which may be seen as being more challenging. That's uh, no criticism, but just to give you a simple example, it may be easier to for an investor to invest in Switzerland than other countries in the world. The idea behind this tool is to uh, guide investors and help them to uh, really make those investments. Now you said there's a lot of high-level documents. I, I've read some of them, not all. There's a, a study, the uh, ACP. They've organized six festivals. And you said that's excellent. It encourages people to uh, set up businesses, but you said that we're lacking funding and the capacity. So that's something very specific where you've identified need. How do you think the European Union, as the biggest donor organization, how can they help? Perhaps the others have some ideas on this as well. Well, as a donors, a donor organization, we have rules that, uh, for better or for worse, uh, guide what we do. We are currently re revising uh, those as part of our midterm review. We uh, will carry that out as part of our periodic uh, review process. And of course, there are uh, some parts of the fund which are going to become available. And we will be re-examining each project on a case-by-case -case basis to make sure that we haven't missed anything uh, and particularly paying attention to the cultural dimension. Now, it may sound a little vague. We would have to carry out uh, analysis per country and uh, find interested stakeholders. That's the first step. Secondly, we're going to try and uh, channel part of our funds towards culture, give culture back uh, an important place in our group of projects. We can't fund them all, that would be impossible, but we are committed to earmarking funds for that. And that's just a partial question, answer to your question. <coughs> Well, yes, please. You, I'd like to hear from you. Well, there are a number of possibilities when it comes to international institutions, whether they're creditors from organizations such as UNESCO, you have funds for cultural de development, which give funding to young artists. So these things do exist. Last week, we began African Week in UNESCO around the 25th of May, and we had a whole series of artists, including young designers and so on. But everyone said to me, there's so much red tape in getting this funding that it's off-putting. So these young artists have to, have to fill in a lot of paperwork without even being sure if they'll get the approval to get $10,000, for example. Now, we all know that if that this is somewhere we should start so that we can ensure young people get easier access to funding. And do you have a specific proposal? Well, I think that often the problem 
is in getting $10,000, you need $3,000 in costs. Well, my proposal would be that in concrete terms, I would humbly suggest that you reconsider your procedures because as it currently stands, it's just not manageable because you create structures which are so far removed from us that it makes it complicated for us. This is what is already happening in Europe, but in Africa, it's even worse. We, for us, for example, in my own case, everything I'm doing, everyone is paid except for me in what I work. I live from my work, but I don't have a salary. But so for people who don't have the possibility to hire those people for a structure, if you need to have two jobs to see if we are eligible and build up our file, it's, it's just impossible. So maybe in your structures, in your various centers, you could have people who are dealing with filling in one stage of the procedure if it's really impossible to simplify. You do need something like this because otherwise a lot of the funding will go elsewhere rather than where it's supposed to go. Well, we'll have to move on to the ministers from Burkina Faso. Merci, uh, bien. Thank you. If you could just uh, stand up so that everyone can see you, please. Thank you. I just have a few words to say. First of all, Burkina Faso understood uh, the uh, saying, no future without culture, a long time ago. And we have uh, been working on uh, numerous projects. We have uh, numerous different uh, activities, festivals, a week of culture, for example, and we are doing uh, what we can to promote culture. And that will help us to uh, improve development whilst uh, protecting our, our culture, our uh, society. And there is this economic dimension which needs to be married with the societal aspect of culture. You need the right environment, the right ecosystem. So we need to link up different stakeholders, create the cultural infrastructure that they need, create the legislative framework that they need. The, our National Assembly recently adopted a, a, a law to this end. We need to create incentives, setting up uh, funding opportunities for those who have uh, talent. So you s talked about the uh, festivals in Burkina Faso for film and culture. What do you think that international institutions or yourselves could do to encourage more cultural activity? to get people involved and create jobs. We don't want our projects to fizzle out due to a lack of funding. We have set up our own branch of the Cultural Tourist Development Fund. But the state itself cannot fund everything, and that's why we have uh, called upon technical financial partners to help us to accrue more resources so that we can um, support these different cultural product projects. And with our new uh, development uh, plan for cultural activity, we hope to uh, improve that even further. Thank you. Can I just give the microphone to the Secretary General of CGLU? I'm sorry we don't have a lot of time for Q&A, but we have the cloud at the end. You will be able to comment on the cloud. <laughs> well, it doesn't work really well. Oh, no, no, that doesn't work. 
Well, I am pleased that uh, CGLU, I'm surprised that it's not on this board, because if there is a, an institution which fought right from the start, along with our friends from UNESCO, it's definitely ours. The CGLU is, is a global organization of local communities. And we fought to ensure that cultural would be recognized as the fourth pillar of de sustainable development. And you are correct, Ms. Tare, in saying that we don't do enough. Local communities are not doing enough. I am in a country, I'm in Morocco, where almost every community has its own festival. And the festival is very much supported by the local powers. And then the sector, private sector becomes, gets involved when something has already been launched. They don't, they follow, they don't lead. So we need to be very attentive. Let's not get mixed up between what has been achieved in developed countries and what is being built in developing countries. It's very important to bear that in mind. I'm very pleased with what the Minister of Burkina Faso said, because it is a path to be followed. And this path needs to be shared. It's a shared journey. There is a pan-African uh, institution which suggested on the 25th of January that we should have a, Nash, a day of the African unity. Now, this is not a proposal from African Union or UNESCO. Wonderful, wonderful, brilliant. But well, I would just finish up. I know you're eager to let others speak. But just one final comment. We are really doing our best to make sure that every com local community has a plan for the future. And this can only be carried out with cultural agents, people in the cultural sector. We cannot give all the support that we would like to, but we really hope that UNESCO will be able to support our cultural sector in Africa as it has done elsewhere. Everything you're doing here can also be done in Africa. Thank you very much. If you could pass the microphone to Marilyn, Marilyn Douarabel, director of the Douala Cultural Center and contemporary art. Well, I'll try to be as brief as possible, but and I found a number of points worthy of mention. The link between culture and the economy is clear, but I'm a bit uneasy when we talk about the private sector. Who are we referring to, really? Is it big companies? Who should get involved in culture? Are we talking about companies sponsoring culture? Or are you talking about us? We are companies belonging to the private sector, but we're civil society companies. Are we talking about S SMEs and micro SMEs? So when we talk about companies, it's rather um, disconcerting because we don't know exactly who we're referring to. Now, something else which uh, was referred to was the idea of a social contract. We need a new social contract. And in culture, I think we, need, we also need to talk about art when we refer to culture. So in the world of culture and art, we need to create a new social contract between the majority of society where they have uh, platforms for expression through culture and governments. And I think it's important to use the term that was used earlier. And we have a policy of proximity. We are talking about these big mirrors, these big festivals, which is a is wonderful endeavor. But we also need to reflect on decentralization and on partnerships between local communities and the various sectors to ensure 
that we can have structural policy so that, well, for example, if I die, but I hope the, the big guy upstairs won't let that happen, that someone else will be able to keep it, things going. And something we need is, for example, training for managing positions, how to manage things. And in my country, there are no cultural um, units in my section. So in my town, the European, uh, the urban center of Douala, we've signed a cultural contract with them, but not every, there are, there's not enough training provided. So it's not enough about training for artists. This isn't enough. And a final point that I want to share is the need to ensure that creditors are aware of art is a kind of laboratory. We cannot be guaranteed of a precise result. We know there will be a result, and creditors need to be aware of this in supporting their proximity policies. They need to be flexible. We are talking about simplification. We, it's true we need partners who we can discute, d discuss with. We can, but we also need to work on this together. It shouldn't be rules that are imposed upon us where we cannot be productive. OK, I think we'll move on to the cloud now. And we have two questions here. The first question, you, you can answer in English or in French if you wish. Here's the question. Told creativity is investing. What would you suggest? What would you suggest? So we've talked about how important investment is, creativity is. What does it mean to you? Okay. Okay, I'm trying to find out a bit more information. I'm afraid we have to wrap up soon because the next session will start. I think we have about uh, five minutes or so. We can ask you for your thoughts. I uh, saw you noting something down, Fabien. Perhaps you could uh, give us your reactions to what you've heard. Well, I think we've had a very interesting debate on uh, the relationship between economy and culture and uh, the need to create a sound uh, investment culture to promote culture. But I think that whichever side uh, you're looking at it from, you cannot Im forget the importance of culture. It is absolutely crucial. It helps to educate uh, men and women and helps them to live together. And we shouldn't allow the economic uh, aspect to dominate that. Because at the end of the day, um, what we're really a aiming uh, for is uh, promoting uh, better uh, cultural life and society. You said we need a, a better definition of uh, what we're dealing with here. Do you have any response to that? Well, the private sector is a very broad church, yes. But I'm sure they could have a role to play. And yes, perhaps we need to make sure that's better uh, targeted. Perhaps there are people out in the room who have suggestions or their responses to the cloud question. So I open up the floor to your reactions, if anyone would like to speak. Yes, I have a question. Ah, we voilà the cloud, OK. Innovation, enfin, des idées. Il faut avoir des idées, innover. Exactement. OK. Next question. Priority for the cultural and creative sectors and creative industries in the developing countries. What is the main priority 
for the cultural and creative sectors. What's the main priority? Quelle est la priorité? I'm sorry if I didn't explain how to connect. Uh, hopefully, many of you are uh, already connected. People. Very good. Okay. I think we should wrap it up, huh? Yes. Um, I think this was quite enlightening. Uh, pardon, excusez-moi. Uh, C'était vraiment une, uh, une bonne... This was an excellent uh, debate, exchange of ideas with people working out in the field with those representing institutions, and that's what we hope to see more of over the next few days as part of EU Dev Days. I hope that we have set the tone. It was our pleasure to uh, kick off this part of the EU Dev Days with the topic of art and culture. It's fascinating to see um, how important this topic is that we've been allowed to kick off the debate today. So it's left to me to thank you. You uh, contributed to this excellent uh, dialogue and I hope that uh, when you leave this session and go to uh, other uh, sessions that you'll continue this dialogue. Uh, it's only through that cooperation that we will uh, really achieve our goals. Thank you very much. Thank you.